I'm going to ask you to open your Bibles with me this morning to Jeremiah chapter 29. Jeremiah 29. Jeremiah is the Lord's prophet in a really dark, dark time in Israel's history. God has raised him up with a difficult message, confronting Israel with the consequences of their turning their backs to the Lord and not their faces. And so the Lord was disciplining his people. He was about to bring the Babylonian army in to invade Judah, but already the discipline of the Lord was being played out in the lives of, of his people. Most and many of the religious and political leaders and many of the artisans and, and, uh, and skilled craftsmen and their families had been carried off as exiles into captivity in Babylon already. And the Lord came to Jeremiah one day and said, Jeremiah, I want you to write a letter to the exiles, a letter that contains the light that they need in the dark seasons of life. That's what I want to talk to you about this morning, is light in the darkness how do we get through? How do we know how to pray? What to think? And so the Lord writes this letter through Jeremiah to his people in exile. I want to pick up reading in Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 4, verses that are familiar to many of us. But I hope today that you'll see them in an even more beautiful light. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and settle down. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there. Do not decrease. Also, Seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. Yes, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. Do not let the prophets and diviners among you deceive you. Do not listen to the dreams you encourage them to have. They are prophesying lies to you in my name. I have not sent them declares the Lord. But this is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my gracious promise to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. And I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and will bring you back from captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and places where I have banished you, declares the Lord, and will bring you back to the place from which I carried you into exile. Sooner or later, we're all going to find ourselves going through dark times in life. And for us, it may be like it was for the exiles, a, a consequence of our own sin and disobedience. And the Lord has to send trouble our way to, to discipline. Other times, it may be as a result of the sins of someone else or simply that we are living in a fallen world where there is sickness and, and death and and lost jobs and tragic accidents. And so how do we make sense of it all when we go through those dark times? Does God still love us? Does he still have a plan for us? What are we to think? What are we to pray? We need light for the dark seasons of life, and we can trust God to give us that light. Amen? So I want you to see here in our text today what we need most in times of darkness. And the first thing we need is to let God speak in our dark times. We need to let God 
speak in our dark times. Now, this is the purpose in the letter that Jeremiah is writing. You see, God is always speaking through the circumstances of our life. Whether we're listening or not, he is speaking. Nothing will make any sense if we're not driven to seek the Lord in his word. Look at what he says in verse 4. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all those I carried in the back, in, into exile in Babylon. And so God is speaking. The same thing is repeated in verse 8. And in verse 10, Jeremiah writes, this is what the Lord says. In verse 11, twice in verse 14, he says, this is what the Lord declares. God is speaking, and we need to listen to him. Now, the first and most important way that God speaks to us is through his word, his written word. Uh, the, the, the letter that Jeremiah wrote to the exiles was God's written word to them. And the Bible that you hold in your hand is God's written word to us. And what has to happen to us in the middle of our darkness is that we, it has to drive us to seek the Lord in his word and to get the light that we need for the dark times. You know, early, earlier I told you about Hillary Scott. She was going through this difficult pregnancy. And she went through that time when she didn't know how to pray, and the words were just not coming. But notice she got into the Word. She got to Matthew chapter 6 and to the Sermon on the Mount, and, she, and the Lord showed her how to pray. The Lord showed her how she was to face these dark days. And so as we faithfully read and study the Word of God, and as we hear it preached and taught, God speaks into our dark times. He gives us the light that we need for the darkness. Now, when we go to the Lord and his word, we need to be careful that we're reading and studying the Bible properly. Because if we're not, it will be easy for us to find a place in the scripture, a verse, and take it out of context and make it say something that God never intended for it to say. As a matter of fact, that happens with this very passage of Scripture here. Believe it or not, Jeremiah 29 verse 11 is claimed so often, but it is often misinterpreted and uh, as to, to say, listen, God, is, uh, God always wants good things and great things to happen to you. And, uh, and, and, and bad times will never come to God's people. As a matter of fact, this very kind of misinterpretation of the word of God was happening to Israel, to Judah. You notice in verses 8 and 9 that there were false prophets. Yes, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel says, do not let the prophets and diviners among you deceive you. He says there, you... Do not listen to the dreams you encourage them to have so the people are egging on these false prophets. Oh, just go out and have as many dreams as you want. Tell us what you hear. doesn't matter whether you hear from God. Verse 9, they are prophesying lies to you in my name. I have not sent them, declares the Lord. Now, the peace and prosperity prophets were telling them that the exile is only going to last a couple of years. Just a couple of years, and then happy days are here again. But sorry, that's not, that's not the Lord's plan. For the fact is that the discipline of the Lord was not going to last two years. It was going to last 70 years. And, and yet, in spite of that, God's Word shows us how we are to go through the hard times, the dark times, the disappointing times that last a lot longer than we want them to. God is faithful when we will look to him in his word and see his plans for us. And so the first thing we need in dark times is we need to let God speak into our situations. But here's the next thing we need. We need to see the hand of God in our circumstances. We need to see the hand of God in our dark times. When we're going through those dark times, whether it's discipline from the Lord or, or simply the fact that we're living in a fallen world, our faith 
can falter sometimes, and, 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 and we, we think maybe God has abandoned us or he doesn't have any plans for us, that we're out of his will and he wants to, doesn't want to have anything to do with us any longer. But, but notice how this is worded here in verse 4. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says, notice, to all those I carried into exile. This is the hand of God at work. So it wasn't just a mess that they made for themselves. It, it wasn't just a, a series of bad luck and misfortunate encounters with an, with an evil king. This is the hand of the Lord. He says, I carried you into Babylon, into exile. And one of the most important things that can happen to us in the midst of our dark and disappointing times is for us to have our faith reinforced in the sovereignty and the providence of of the Lord. God isn't sitting up in heaven wringing his hand saying, oops, I didn't see that coming. He's sovereign in all these things. This isn't just a mess that they made for themselves. This is the hand of God working in a loving way toward his covenant people. Maybe you made a mistake or committed a sin and as a result of that there, there's an unwanted, an unplanned pregnancy, a bankruptcy, a shattered marriage or whatever. And you've wondered time and time again, am I just destined to live out plan B or plan C for my life? Well, I never feel like I'm in the middle of God's will again. Well, I'm here today to tell you that whether you're living with the consequences of choices that you made or you are the victim of the sins of others or just living in a fallen world, the fact is that God is working. He is strong enough and you can worship a God who has his hands on all of the details of your life. He loves you and has plans for you. And even though you're going through a dark time, the hand of God is presiding over it all. He knows how much to put on you at any given time. He knows what discipline will work and what discipline won't work. And so the next thing that needs to happen is that we need to see the hand of God. He has a way for us to live our lives even when we're under his discipline. And so that leads me to the next thing we need, and that is we need to learn how God wants us to live in dark times. We need to learn how God wants us to live in in dark times. Now, God's Word doesn't always tell us why things happen, but I tell you, you can trust God to always show you how He wants you to live as you're going through the dark seasons of life, how He wants you to conduct yourself. And life hasn't gone the way that you want it to go. And if you could turn back the clock and do something over again, you would, but you can't. But I want to tell you today that you're just one act of obedience away from being back in the center of God's will for your life. You see, there's always a way back from here. I don't care what kind of mess you've made of your life. There's always a way back from here. You're one step, one act of obedience away from being back in the center of God's will. And so the Lord writes to the exiles and he says, listen, I know you feel beat up over this. And I know this is a time of darkness. And it's, and it's going to last a lot longer than you think. But I have plans for you. This is how I want you to live the rest of your life. Notice what he says there, there, beginning in verse 5. He said, I want you to live productive lives. I want you to live productive lives. Verses 5 and 6. He says, build houses and settle down and plant gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters and find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there. Do not, do not decrease. So the Lord is saying, listen, this is, this is going to last longer than you think, so, so make the best of it. Get on with the business of living. 
Yes, you've made mistakes. Yes, you've messed up your life. Yes, things have not gone the way you hope. But listen, God can use you where you are. He certainly can't use you where you aren't. He wants to use you where you are. So get on about the the grace of living. And isn't it great of God and good of God to just let us, even when we're going through times of discipline and trouble, that God still lets us enjoy the good things of life, of eating and, 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 and enjoying our families and marriage and having kids and grandkids. This is just the common grace of God to us. God is so good, even in this fallen world, even in the troubles of life, that if we just look up for a moment, we can see his goodness and his grace. And so, the Lord says, I know you think your life stinks, but there's something for you to do, to live in the middle of God's will, even when you're going through discipline. Now, here's something else that, that, that's pretty interesting. Some of the people who received this letter would not be alive at the end of the 70 years. Some of them may have already been up there in years, and when 70 years are completed, they would be off the scene. And yet, the Lord has a plan for them. He says, listen, your job, your job is to raise up the next generation. There's another generation that's going to go in, they're going to go back to your homeland, and they're going to rebuild and reestablish the life of the people of God. Your job is to get that generation ready. And you may be looking at your life right now and saying, oh, not much I can do. I'm a senior adult, grandparent, and nobody listens to me anymore, and I don't really make a contribution. Listen, you can. Your job is to get the next generation ready to serve the purposes of God in their generation. That's our job. Leave a legacy and make it a good one. So he says, live productive lives. But also he says, be a positive influence. Be a positive influence. Verse 7, also, he says, seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I carried you into exile. So this is what God expects of us as his people living in exile. We are Christ's followers. We are in exile. This world is not our home. Our home is in heaven, and one day we will go there. But in the meantime, the Lord has left us here as exiles in this world to live faithfully and to be salt and light and to be positive influences wherever he puts us, to seek and pros- the, the, the peace and prosperity of the land. We're to be peacemakers and not troublemakers. Be good citizens. And in doing that, we bring down the grace of God on our our fallen culture. So be a positive influence. And then he says be a prayerful influence. Be a prayerful influence. Verse 7 continues, pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. Now this is the Old Testament parallel to uh, the teachings of Jesus when he said pray for your enemies. It's a parallel to the command in the New Testament that tells us that we are to pray for our governing authorities. And so one of the ways that we submit to God is that we submit to those whom God has has placed over us and we pray for them. And in doing this, we we are seeing the hand of God at work through them, whether they are righteous or not. We pray for them. And, uh, and so in doing this, we live as God wants us to live in the dark days of life. So don't give up. There's still something for you to do, even if you feel like you're, you're in plan B or plan C. There's, there's a way back from here. Begin to live obediently as his people. And then number four, the next thing we need is to trust the eternal purposes of God. Trust the eternal purposes of God. Verse 10 says... This is what the Lord says, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my gracious promise to bring you back to this place. So Jeremiah is standing in the counsel of the Lord. 
He has heard from God, and God revealed to Jeremiah what his plans are, not just for the Jews, but also for Babylon. Notice the way it's worded there in verse 10, when 70 years are completed, not for the Jews, for Babylon. You see, God is working in all of the details. He's working out his eternal purposes in every detail of history. 70 years, the Babylonians are going to get what's coming to them. Just because because God used them doesn't mean that uh, they are righteous. You know, God can hit a straight lip with a crooked stick sometimes, and he does that with Babylon. But they shouldn't think that they're going to get away with their paganism and sinful ways. He said, I'm going to deal with them. But guess how he's going to do that? He's going to raise up the Persians. The king of Persia is a man by the name of Cyrus. It just so happens that God has given Cyrus a tender heart toward the Jews. And so he sends them back to their homeland, not only them, but sends resources back with them so that they can go back and reestablish themselves. Isn't God amazing? How he works in all, he works out his eternal purposes in all of the, all of the details of of history. The Lord says there in verse 10, I will fulfill my gracious promise toward you. Now, what is that gracious promise? For your homework this afternoon, go back to uh, Deuteronomy chapter 30, because this is where that gracious promise was first given, all the way back when God first took Israel to be his covenant people, a thousand years before this. And he said to them, and God knew then when he established the covenant that there would come a time when they turned their back on him. There would come a time when they violated that covenant. And the Lord says in those days, I'm going to discipline you. You're my people and I love you. And I'm working in your life through discipline. So I'm going to discipline you this way. I'm going to send you off. You're going to be carried off as captives into, into, into foreign lands. But he said, I'm not finished with you. Because I will bring you back. My gracious promise is that I will restore you and bring you back from all of the lands where I have sent you off as captives and exiles. And so the Lord is working out his gracious promise for us. No matter what happens, no matter what we go through in dark times, God cannot be diverted from his gracious promises of fulfilling. God always delivers on his promises to his people. I had to go to Houston uh, a couple of months ago for a meeting. So I went online and I I bought a ticket uh, for a flight from DFW to Houston Hobby. When I got on the plane, I had in my hand a boarding pass um, that said I had a seat on flight whatever from DFW to Houston Hobby. When I got on the plane, the flight attendants welcomed us aboard and, and said, uh, our flight down to Houston Hobby will, will take about an hour. Well, the plane landed, and I got off the plane, and I was walking down the concourse. And I looked up, and there was one of these video advertising boards. You've seen those video screens where people advertise different things. And there was this message on there that said, welcome to Baltimore. I tell you, I stopped dead in my tracks. I had this sinking feeling in the pit of my stomach. How in the world did I get on the wrong plane? I mean, it was so plain, it was so clear. How, what did I do wrong? And then the message changed and it said, just kidding, but I got your attention, didn't I? I mean, I wanted to punch the screen. (laughs) But I am so thankful that God always delivers on his promises. When he says, I'm going to get you there, he's going to get us there. No matter what kind of obstacles and roadblocks we find along the way, He is there. You can count on him to deliver on what he says he will do, his eternal purposes. 
Now we come to verse 11 that we know so well. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. Now, how many of you would say that that may be your favorite verse in all the Bible? Many of you would say that that is the case. Well, perhaps you have a better understanding now of what that verse really means. It is light for the dark times. It does not mean that everything that happens to us is good and great. And it does not mean that uh, if there is anything bad that happens to us, it won't last long. Now, what this verse says is that even if the discipline and even if the darkness and the hard times last for 70 years, it will not thwart my good purposes for you. Nothing, nothing can separate us from the love of God. Now, here's the cool thing about this. I said earlier that some of those saints who got the, the, got the word were going to be dead before the 70 years were up. But God's eternal purposes are marching on. Because that little remnant of Jews in Babylon did not dry up and disappear. They thrived. They prospered. They, they increased. They didn't decrease. And so they were ready with new hearts to go back to their homeland. And guess what? They began to lay the foundation for what God was going to do in his new work with his people that will result in the coming of the Messiah. Do you realize that Jesus' earthly descendants were in the exile? The seed of the future was among those exiles. Fourteen generations later, Jesus would be born. The circumstances of our lives cannot stop God from fulfilling his gracious promises for us in Christ. He doesn't promise to make the darkness and pain go away immediately, but what he promises is that none of it can thwart his eternal purposes for his people. Let me just remind you of what Paul said in Romans chapter 8. Again, a very familiar passage to us, almost a twin, a New Testament twin to Jeremiah 29, 11, where Paul says in Romans 8, 28, and we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him. It doesn't say that God work, everything's going to be good. It says that he is working good to those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image, to the likeness of his son. That's what he's up to. That he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. You see, this is what God is up to in your dark times. He is shaping you into the likeness of his son, Jesus. He's using all of the pain and heartaches as sandpaper, crafting you, sanctifying you into the likeness of his son, Jesus And the Bible says that one day God will deliver us before himself complete in Christ, perfectly conformed to the image of Christ when we are glorified with our new resurrection bodies, with no more sin and no more scars of a sinful life. God's eternal purposes will be fulfilled in you and through you no matter how dark and bad and disappointing the circumstances are. And so, you can look forward to that future. And when you get saved, that's just the beginning. He's going to keep working and keep working. And one day you'll be presented complete before Christ. But there's one more thing that we need as we go through the dark times. And that is that we need to deepen our intimacy with God. 
We need to deepen our intimacy with God. Verse 12 says, Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 12, Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. In verse 13, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. Now, verse 12 begins with the word then. When is then? Well, it is after you've come through the dark times, after you've gone through those troubles, that you will come to a place of renewed intimacy with the Lord. Then, he says, you will, you will call upon me. Then you will come and pray to me, and then you will seek me, and you will find me when you seek me with all your heart. So we're to seek the Lord exclusively. Seek the Lord exclusively. He says in verse 12, then you will seek me, and then you will find me. And verse 13, you'll seek me. You'll, and, and 12, you'll call upon me and pray to me. What is he doing here? He is breaking them of their idolatrous ways. Remember, that's what got them into this mess to begin with. They were, they were seeking after. Their hearts were turned toward pagan idols. Their backs turned to God, their faces toward these pagan idols, but not anymore. He says, you will call upon me and pray to me and seek me after I, after I root out all that idolatry in your heart. You will seek me and not those other things that you look for for meaning and security in your life. Seek the Lord exclusively. We seek the Lord intensely. Notice the intensity of this. He says, you, you'll call upon me and you will come and pray to me and you will seek me, he says in verse 13, with all your heart. That's intensity. And how many of you know how God can, can use the dark times in our lives to bring us to a place where we hunger for him more than anything else in this life? It's the best thing that could happen to us through hard times is that we seek him intently. And then we seek the Lord expectantly. He says, when you, when you call upon him and come and pray to him and seek him with all your heart, he says, you will find me. I will be found by you. So when you turn back to the Lord with all your heart, he will not turn his back on you. You can seek him expectantly. And he says in verse 14, then I will be found by you and will bring you back from captivity and I will gather you from all the nations and places where I've banished you. When he says there, I'll bring you back from your captivity, he's not just talking about physical restoration. Hebrew scholars tell us that that phrase means a total restoration of everything that was lost. And what they lost most importantly, was their intimacy with God. And so you come to a place where, where your, your greatest concern is that you're not seeking God to do something for you. Take the darkness and the pain and the suffering away. It's that we are seeking God to do something in us. Not, not just for us, but something in us in renewed intimacy with Him. And that's when God's discipline really is for our good. You know, the writer of Hebrews says, our fathers disciplined us for a little while as they thought best. But God disciplines us for our good that we may share in his holiness. Church, that's what he's after. In all of the heartaches and the disappointments of life, it's discipline from the Lord that we may share in his holiness. And, and so I hope you're encouraged today that those dark times that you're walking through right now, it's not like you're walking into a dark cave. You're walking through a dark 
tunnel. Yes, it is dark at times, but it is a tunnel. There's an end on the other side, and there you will find the goodness of the Lord and the purposes of the Lord fleshed out and worked out in every detail. And that's the light that we need in dark times. And will you join me as we pray? Lord, we stand amazed in your word. And Lord, thank you that you love us enough not to send us through the dark times alone. Your word is there. You're speaking. You're working. You're moving according to your eternal purposes, Lord, and we get impatient. Oh, Lord, we want it to be over today. And yet, Lord, you say I'm working purposes. It will take an eternity, but it will be worth it all when we see Jesus. 